Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to Midwest Mountaineering's Outdoor Adventure Expo. With me virtually, I have uh, Renee Davies uh, from uh, Nomad Adventures. Um, <clears throat> Renee is here to present on exploring the Galapagos Islands and mainland Ecuador. It's sure to be a visually stunning uh, presentation um, with, filled with a lot of great travel info. Um, as I know that I'm personally interested in visiting some of these areas, especially with hopefully travel opening up here in the next few months. Um, so without further ado, here's Renee. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you guys all for being here. Um, Adana and I were just talking about how it's kind of weird not knowing exactly how many faces I'm talking to right now, but thanks for being here. Um, as you said, my name is Renee. I am a trip specialist at Nomad Adventures. Um, Nomad is a um, company based in South Minneapolis. Um, we do private and custom travel to South America. Um, so private and custom, what that really means is we don't do um, fixed state, fixed itinerary trips where you sign up to go with a group of travelers that you don't know on kind of an itinerary, a fixed itinerary. We instead work with you and your own group of travelers um, to design a trip that's entirely tailored to your own travel style. Um, so the start of our process is something that we call a discovery. Um, here you can see our process outline discovery skeleton proposal adventure. Um, so the first part of that process is what we call a discovery phone call. So I can just learn a little bit more about you, um, the types of accommodations you enjoy, how active you like to be, um, how long you have to travel, when you can go, budget, really everything under the sun. So then I can design a trip that's tailored to your own travel style and perfectly matches you and your own group. So we work with a lot of just couples. Like sometimes people think, oh, I must need a big group then to go. You really don't. Over 50% of our groups are just two people. Um, but we work with a lot of couples, a lot of families, a lot of groups of friends. We do some special interest groups as well. Um, and then once you arrive, really everything's taken care of, guiding, transfers, hotels, so you can just arrive and enjoy the trip. Um, so that's a little bit about us. If you're interested in learning more, you can go to our website, www.nomadadventures.com, and that's nomad, K-N-O-W-M-A-D. Um, but that's enough about us. So I'm sure you guys are all here to learn more about the Galapagos and Ecuador. Um, so Ecuador, you can see, is a small country here, just north of Peru. Um, I really love the way it... Oh, just describes it here of big things come in small packages is an adage that holds true in Ecuador and the Galapagos. Mainland Ecuador is about the same size as the US state of Colorado, yet it contains nearly every ecosystem imaginable. Without having to travel great times or distances, visits to Ecuador can include cloud forest, Andean highlands, historic haciendas, remote indigenous communities, volcanoes, Amazon jungle, and colonial cities. Of course, no visit to Ecuador is complete without a visit to the famed Galapagos Islands. Um, so to kind of show you what that's talking about here, you have Ecuador and then of course off the coast, you have the Galapagos. But just in this area, which like it says is the size of Colorado, you have the Amazon jungle over here. One of my favorite Amazon jungle lodges in all of South America is in Ecuador. Um, so if you've ever wanted to go to the Amazon, this is a great opportunity to do it. Um, and it's just a short 30 minute flight over to the Amazon. And we'll dive into each of these regions in the presentation, but just to kind of show you a high level from the map. Um, so just a short 30 minute flight um, east and you're in the Amazon jungle. And then just about an hour and a half to two hours northwest of Quito up here, you have the cloud forest, which is one of the most biodiverse areas in the entire world and exceptional for birding. Um, about an hour and a half to two hours north, you have Otavalo, where you have um, one of the largest artisan markets in all of Latin America and just really beautiful landscapes and great spot for some culture. Heading just about an hour and a half to two hours south of Quito, you have Cotopaxi National Park, where you have this perfect cone volcano surrounded by high pampa and other mountains. So just in this small area here within one and a half to two hours of Quito, you have so many different things you can see and do. And then that short flight to the Amazon for a whole nother op option. Um, so that's really something special about Ecuador, which is nice as well. We, we're finding a lot of travelers 
don't want to be moving a lot right now. They don't want long transfers. Um, so Ecuador is a great fit for that in the sense of you can really do and see a lot on a trip without having additional long flights or additional long transfers. Um, so it's, it's a cool aspect of the country. Um, I'm not going to dive too much into the history and culture. You'll learn a lot about that from your guide if you go. Um, but one thing I always like to point out is that compared to its neighbor Peru, you really don't have the same history and impact of the Incan Empire in Ecuador. They, the Incans really just barely started to arrive to Ecuador when then the Spaniards arrived. So you have a lot more kind of um, influence from the Spanish and um, kind of colonial architecture and you don't see the same level of, there are a few, but you don't see the same level of kind of Incan ruins that you see in um, Peru. And then biodiversity, um, like it says here, Ecuador is the most biodiverse country in the world per unit area. Um, it's really incredible how many different species and especially how many different types of birds are in um, just that small size of the country. All right, so kind of diving through some of the different regions that we suggest going to on a trip. Um, Quito is the first one. So flying from the US, you're gonna need to either fly into Quito or into Guayaquil. One of my biggest recommendations on any trip to the Galapagos Islands, if you're just doing the Galapagos and that's the main focus of the trip and you don't have the time to kind of extend on that in mainland Ecuador, I highly, highly recommend at least two nights in mainland Ecuador prior to flying out to the Galapagos Islands. Um, so for Minneapolis travelers, for example, you're often flying Minneapolis to Atlanta and then taking a flight from Atlanta to Quito. If your flight from Minneapolis to Atlanta is delayed and you miss that flight from Atlanta to Quito, there's not another flight until the following day. So if you have that international flight, butt it up against a flight in the morning, which the flights to the Galapagos are in the morning, out to the islands to then board a cruise and you have that domino effect of missing your international flight, you then miss boarding your cruise in the entire you know, focus of the trip. Um, so it's a really bad kind of domino effect that you can avoid by just having a two night buffer in either Quito or Guayaquil on the front end of your trip. Um, because you really want that two night buffer, I often suggest flying into Quito instead of Guayaquil because um, for Minneapolis travelers, there's a lot better flight options, but also just because it's a really cool city. Quito is um, one of the first UNESCO World Heritage Sites in the world. As you can see in this photo, you have beautiful um, colonial architecture, cobblestone streets, um, really beautiful cathedrals there. And then also one of my favorite things is just going right north of Quito. You have the equator and there's a fun little museum there called the Intignan Museum that actually is right on the equator and they've <laughs> painted a line within the museum where you can see all the side effects of standing right on the equator and then stepping right off of it. Um, and they do the thing with the sink and the water flowing different directions. Um, it's a really fun stop. So not only is spending a full day in Quito really recommended for that buffer, but it's a really great use of your time as well. Generally two nights in Quito is a good amount of time. Um, if you're someone that really loves cities, you love to do kind of a full day with a guide, but have time to explore on your own as well, you could go up to three nights. For most people, two nights is a good amount of time. All right, so Otavalo is that area that I said is a great cultural extension, about an hour and a half to two hours um, north of Quito. You can go to Otavalo just as a day trip from Quito to go see the Otavalo market, see some sites and come back. Um, but it's a minimum of three hours driving time, more likely four, and it could be more based with traffic getting into and out of Quito. So I do really like travelers to more spend um, two nights ideally in this area. One of my favorite spots to say, stay is outside of Otavalo at an hacienda called Hacienda Zuleta. And for Zuleta, I love to see anywhere from two to four nights staying there. Um, it's a great spot for self-guided hiking. They have an entire, their property is full of all these beautiful self-guided hikes to waterfalls, to a condo rehabilitation center, um, to beautiful just viewpoints. And then you can also arrange for a day trip to the Otavala market from there as well. Um, so this is a great extension option, either pre or post the Galapagos with two or three nights. 
If you're short on time, you can do a day trip instead. Um, and I highly recommend considering Hacienda Zuleta as accommodations. With Zuleta, I do kind of prefer it on the back end of the trip um, because it's such a great property for being flexible and doing things self-guided, which is great to come after the Galapagos where you naturally have to be very guided in the Galapagos. So it helps balance that out to then arrive to a place where you can just do a lot of things self-guided. All right, next area. The cloud forest. So again, about an hour and a half to two hours or some lodges up to three hours from Quito. Um, like Otavalo, you can do a day trip there as well. Um, so if you're short on time, really want to see the cloud forest, don't mind day trips with a little bit more drive time, like kind of sitting back and, and watching um, outside your window, then it makes a, for a fine day trip. But I generally recommend people stay for more two nights. So you really have a true full day in the cloud forest of excursions. Um, there's lots of different lodge options. Uh, mosh fee for travelers who lean more towards luxury level. Um, it's a very nice luxurious lodge, mosh fee. That one's closer to three, three hours away. I, I do recommend those two nights. Um, Bella Vista is another great, more kind of just three-star clean and comfortable lodge option. Um, the Cloud Forest is a great place to go for more nature, light hiking, but really especially for birders. If you would describe yourself at all as a birder, then I highly recommend considering and adding on the Cloud Forest to your Ecuador trip. Um, I've had people, birders go and go to the Galapagos and go to the Cloud Forest and they said the Cloud Forest was their highlight for birding, um, which pairing with the Galapagos says, says a lot. Um, but beautiful area and just fantastic for birding, especially for the hummingbirds, as you can see in this photo. All right, so Avenue of the Volcanoes, or specifically here in this main photo, you have Cotopaxi National Park. Cotopaxi National Park is, again, only about an hour and a half to two hours from Quito. Same as with the other regions, you can go on a day trip. Um, but I, you know, again, you have that three to four hours of driving in one day. So if you have the time to go and stay there, I recommend again the stay of two nights so you have a true full day there. Another really important consideration with thinking about this region is acclimatization. Um, so Quito's at about 9,000 feet. Here you're at closer to 12,000 or when you're doing the hikes even above 12,000 feet. So you do not want to fly into Quito and then the next day most flights arriving into Quito arrive late at night. You don't want to fly into Quito and the next day go to Cotopaxi National Park and plan for a hike. Um, you won't be acclimatized and you won't feel very good and could have some more severe side effects of altitude sickness. Um, so instead, I suggest, you know, be, being really careful with how and when you plan this region. If you are interested in multiple regions that we've just talked about, one flow I really like is doing your time in Quito then going to the Otavalo area, which is actually even lower. Um, so it's a nice spot to do some more acclimatization before then getting up to uh, Cotopaxi National Park. You can do great hiking in this area. You can climb to the first people do summit Coto oh, Cotopaxi Volcano, but you can also climb up to just the first refugio. Um, but you do wanna be acclimatized before you're doing that. Um, so something to take into consideration as you think about heading to this region. Um, lots of great, really traditional family run haciendas here as well. Hacienda Porvenir is one of my favorites. This photo is of Hacienda Chilcabamba, which is also um, a great option. All right. And then you have Cuenca. So Cuenca is another colonial city like Quito in mainland Ecuador. Um, it is smaller than Quito. It's a really popular place actually for American expats. If you're someone that likes seeing colon really into colonial architecture, you like seeing smaller cities, adding on Cuenca can be something to consider on your trip. You do need to, I suggest from Quito flying to Cuenca, you can do a several day kind of road trip going from Quito down to Cuenca, which for people who like road trips is something to consider. But Otherwise, a short flight to Cuenca, and then I suggest two to three nights there. For people who like doing longer trips and choosing one spot to really settle down, maybe get an Airbnb and spend a full week in one spot, Cuenca is a great fit for that. It's easy to navigate, um, pretty um, easy if you're just, uh, if you don't have a lot of Spanish skills as well. Like I said, it's a 
really popular spot for American expats as well. Um, and then from Cuenca, there's actually a really beautiful drive we do from Cuenca down to the coast, down to Guayaquil to then fly from there out to the Galapagos. And you go from, I think it's about 12,000 feet down to sea level in one day and just are passing lots of different ecosystems on the drive. Um, so really beautiful. And then the Amazon jungle, like I said, just a short 30 minute flight from Quito. Uh, my favorite lodge in the Amazon jungle here is Napa Wildlife Center. I really love them because they're still owned and operated by the local community there. So the profit is going back into that community, which is uh, great to see. This is a fantastic spot for again, nature. Um, you do have great birding here as well. Also more wildlife. The wildlife experience in the Amazon is very different from the Galapagos in the sense that in the Amazon, um, you don't really have to go searching for the wildlife at the visitor sites that you're going to on a cruise or on a land-based trip, it's you know a colony of sea lions here and then you walk further up and a colony of iguanas and they're unfazed by you being there. Whereas in the Amazon, this is a wildlife that traditionally has been poached. So they are very shy of people and they hide. So it's more going out and looking with your guide for the wildlife. And that's the cool aspect of the wildlife experience here is really experiencing the animal's camouflage and the amazing things the guides are able to find and point out, whether it be a camouflaged frog on this leaf or a bunch of monkeys way off in the trees there that you wouldn't have even seen out walking on your own. Um, so a very different wildlife experience from the Galapagos, but really cool in its own way. Um, I suggest three nights here. If the Amazon is just as much a focus of your trip as the Galapagos, then four nights can be incredible as well. And of course the Galapagos Islands. Um, so this is about, the Galapagos are about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. To get there, you are going to fly either from Quito or Guayaquil. If you're flying from Quito, the plane actually stops over in Guayaquil. People get on and off the plane and then it continues on out. Most, most often you'll be flying to an airport here called um, just north of this island here, Santa Cruz. There's a tiny little island called Baltra with the airport on it. That's where most people are flying. That's where a lot of cruises have you starting. But more and more people are also using, there's an airport on San Cristobal here. Both these airports do connect to mainland Ecuador. So flying to one of these kind of two islands. Um, so one important, you know, I have people sometimes that come and they say, oh, I just want to go to the Galapagos for I've even had people say a day trip or just for a few days. One of the important things to realize when you're planning a Galapagos trip is this, they cover an area about the size of the state of New York. Um, it is a big area. So even if the traditional, and we'll kind of talk about duration and, and some more things with the Galapagos, how to pick versus a cruise versus a land-based trip. Um, but even if doing your kind of typical full length seven night, eight day cruise in the Galapagos, you're only gonna see about half of this area. Um, so it really is, you want to devote at least four nights, five days to the Galapagos on your trip um, and anywhere from up to eight days or I've had travelers even stay for two weeks. Um, for most eight days is, is kind of the max, but um, that's what we specialize in. Everyone has their different travel styles and five days is the perfect spot for some and, and 12 days is the perfect spot for others and that's what we help you figure out. Um, but there's lots of different islands and lots of different visitor sites in the Galapagos. So any cruise itinerary is gonna combine different islands of these. And then um, a land-based trip, you can either stay on this island, this island, or doing a kind of island hopping where you're combining different islands. This one, this one, this one, and this one are the four islands you can stay on. So that's Santa Cruz, Isabella, Floriana, and San Cristobal. Um, so you can either do an island hopping program combining those or you can base yourself from Santa Cruz or San Cristobal and do day trips out from there. And again, we'll kind of dive more into how to plan the Galapagos trip later on in the presentation. Um, but first I'm going to dive into just some more photos of those regions that we've talked about to give you guys kind of more of an idea. So here is Quito, like I said, beautiful colonial city. This is a view from a hotel called Casa Gangotena. 
you tend to lean more towards luxury level accommodations, it's a fantastic spot I'd recommend. More of kind of that beautiful colonial architecture that you see in Quito. Colorful buildings now up to Otavalo, that great area for more culture north of Quito, the Otavalo market. This is the livestock market, which is just on, I believe it's Saturdays um, every week. Or what you'll see at the market and some of the beautiful just countryside up there. This is one Hacienda, Hacienda Cuisine, another nice Hacienda property in the area. This is Jordan and Tara. Um, at a lagoon that you can visit up near Otavalo. Local man there. This is at um, Hacienda Zuleta. Tara and Jordan, so that's Nomad's co-founders with their kids when they went to go visit Hacienda Zuleta. It's a great property for kids because it's so flexible um, and has that whole kind of system of self-guided hiking trails and you have a host kind of dedicated to you while you're there. So it's really flexible and, and they can do some fun things with kids. They, um, for Taryn and Jordan's kids, they set up a nice scavenger hunt. That's Tara and I also at Zuleta. Some of the kind of scenery you can see in this area, this specifically is one of the self-guided hikes you can do at Zuleta. Also fantastic for horseback riding. That's Tara bringing the horses in in the morning heading into the Zuleta community right there. Now, this is more the Avenue of the Volcanoes area. It's Antisana Volcano. Also in Avenue of the Volcanoes, a spot further south of Cotopaxi National Park that you can visit if kind of, you can visit it from Cotopaxi National Park with a longer day trip or visit it heading, doing the road trip all the way down to Cuenca. Cotopaxi is a great spot if you want to do some mountain biking. And this is the cloud forest. You can see um, the process of making coffee or also chocolate too. You can see that in Ecuador. This is the cloud forest. This is a hike at that Mashpi Lodge, hiking to a waterfall. Beautiful orchids. This is a tram at one of the lodges. I believe this is El Monte, another lodge choice in the cloud forest. Lots of beautiful flowers in the cloud forest. This is Mashpi, so that luxury lodge choice in the cloud forest. Lots of hummingbirds. This is in the Amazon, so you can see macaw clay lakes from Napa Wildlife Center. There's two different macaw clay lakes that you can go see and the macaws just flock there. Um, so it's really cool to see. Monkeys that you'd see in the Amazon. This is Napa Wildlife Center. So I really like, one thing I also really like about the lodges, the, these kind of private little ca casitas, cabanas, they're um, very comfortable, they're very nice, but they're also very fitting of their surroundings. So it's not a luxury hotel where you don't feel like you're in Ecuador, feel like you're in the Amazon. It's very nice and very comfortable, but also very fitting of its surroundings, which I like. Caymans that you can go searching for in the Amazon jungle. And the Galapagos um, you can do. Some of the cruises have stand up paddle boards, or you can also um, stand up paddle board on a land based trip. This is so when you're on a cruise every morning you are off the boat doing a different excursion and then you're back on for lunch the cruise moves to a different location and then every afternoon you're off the boat doing a different excursion. When you're getting off the boat you're getting into these smaller um, zodiac boats which then take you to shore and you have two types of landings. One is a dry landing which this is where you're stepping from the boat onto kind of a um, rocky surface or you're stepping off of the boat into the water and then walking onto shore. So that's a dry and a wet landing. Um, the different excursions are sometimes you'll have a walk on one of the different, you know, visitor sites on those islands where you're doing a walk with your guide, seeing all the different wildlife. 
The Galapagos is a very educational experience on any trip. You're stopping with the guide when you see wildlife and learning about it. Um, so they're kind of slower walks meant to stop and see the wildlife and learn about it. And then you're also doing snorkeling visits, um, beaches and swimming. You're doing sometimes where you're just in these zodiac boats and you see the different wildlife kind of from the boat going along the shore. Um, and then some boats also have kayaks as well. So it's a very active trip in the sense of it's not kind of what some people imagine as a typical cruise. I encourage people to just see the cruise as their mode of transportation to and from these different visitor sites because you're off the boat every morning doing an excursion back on for lunch it moves to a different spot and then again off the boat in the afternoon so you're very you're really quite active sea turtles that you can see in the galapagos um the snorkeling there the snorkeling is really incredible. The cool aspect of the wildlife in the Galapagos is that they really have little to no fear of humans. So like I said before, it's iguanas and then sea lions and then maybe a tortoise and it's just they're all kind of unfazed by you being there. They don't kind of run away from you. You have to more if there's a tortoise blocking your path, you have to get off the path and, and walk around it. Um, and that's true with the snorkeling as well. Um, some sites I've been in the Galapagos snorkeling, there's, you know, so many sea turtles, you kind of have to move away to avoid running into them because again, they just kind of see you as any other fish in the water with them. Um, there's spots also where you can snorkel with sea lions, a few spots where it's sometimes possible to snorkel with penguins or even iguanas. Um, so it's a really, that's kind of the highlight of the snorkeling experience is snorkeling with the wildlife. You can also do kayaking. Um, these are some of our travelers kayaking on a land-based trip off of Floriana. This is Claudio, who's our um, close partner there. He owns the only kind of um, hotel on Floriana. Is a really um, fascinating guy as his parents were some of the first people to settle in the Galapagos specifically on Floriana, um, which is an island that has just a really interesting and kind of mysterious history to it. So learning about it from him is, is something pretty special. More of you can see kind of they're just <laughs> unfazed by you being there. Um, this is a one of the hikes you can do in the Galapagos. Um, you can do it from a cruise or there's day trips here from a land-based trip as well to Bartholome Island and hiking up um, for this view of Pinnacle Rock. One of the um, hotels in the Galapagos um, that you could stay at on a land-based trip. Um, so some of the cruises, you do have a few kind of different hikes in the Galapagos, but overall for people, if you want to be doing full day, long, difficult hikes, that's something more you'd want to look towards a land-based trip on. The cruises do have to cater to um, a variety of different activity levels, um, but there is some hiking. Seahorse, a land iguana, there's both two different types of species, land iguanas and marine iguanas in the Galapagos. This is the red frigate bird um, that puffs out its chest. Um, so as far as kind of different wildlife on any well-planned Galapagos trip, you're going to see the tortoises, you're going to see iguanas, you're going to see sea lions. Um, out, if there's any, but pretty much on any trip you'd see the blue-footed boobies, but sometimes you see them flying up above or you see them from a rocky shore where there are certain visitor sites where is where you have the opportunity to see them much closer kind of right in front of you. So as you're planning a trip, if you're you know working with a company like us, make sure if there's some specific experience you've envisioned happening on, happening on your trip, whether it be snorkeling with sea lions or seeing the penguins or getting up close to the blue-footed boobies, make sure to express that because they're well, any trip will be an incredible wildlife experience. There certainly are um, spots that are better for certain experiences than others. Islands that are highlights for snorkeling versus islands that are highlights for birding. Um, so make sure whoever you're working with um, knows kind of what your priorities are in the Galapagos as far as what you want to see and, and experience. Pelican, a beach there. Um, this is one of the cruises, Ocean Spray Cruise. Uh, the luxury class cruises, a lot of them have private balconies. Lava cactus on one of the islands there. Um, the lot of the 
Galapagos in a lot of ways feels like you're on another planet. A lot of the terrain there is very, you can see volcanic. You also have spots with like red sand beach and some trees that seem like they're dead, but they're actually very much alive. Um, a lot of, as you look around, there's a lot of spots that feel like you're walking on another planet. The tortoises um, are huge and, and you really can get quite close to them. The blue-footed boobies, which I think are just so cool. Stand up paddle boarding. Um, so this is with snorkeling. Um, oftentimes you are doing kind of open water snorkeling where you're getting in the water more from these zodiac boats. Dolphins sometimes you can see. So this is outside of Puerto Ayora, the main town on Santa Cruz. And that's Jordan and Tara in one of their first Galapagos trips with a giant tortoise. And Finch Bay, one of the hotel options near Puerto Ayora, the Ocean Spray Cruise. All right, so how to pick between a land-based Galapagos trip or a cruise, um, or if you kind of have a hard time picking and you like ideas of both of these, you can certainly do a combination as well. Um, so cruise, cruise is like I said, kind of like how I explained you're off the boat every morning then it moves when you're on board eating lunch back on off the boat in the afternoon and then it moves when you're on board having dinner and sleeping so they are the best to get you to a wide variety of visitor sites in a short amount of time they're very time efficient effective to have you see a lot of wildlife and get to some of these further out um further out spots so for people who don't have any hesitation to be kind of sleeping on a boat, um, who wildlife really is the priority of being there, um, I generally lean towards including a cruise in at least part of your trip, whether it be a cruise and land combo or doing a full cruise. Um, they do, they, like I said, they're just very efficient in getting you to a lot of visitor sites in a short amount of time. So you get in a five-day cruise versus a five-day land-based trip, you will make it to more island visits and more visitor sites on the cruise. However, the cruises are very structured um, and they have to be. So you have, again, that morning visit back on an afternoon visit. The cruises have, they have the exact time that they're allowed to be at the site, what activity that they're allowed to do, and you have to stay with the guide. The Galapagos, over 90% of the Galapagos is the national park and it's very regulated. You have to be with a guide to be in it. And you, those, these cruises have to have their itinerary and permits specifically approved by the national park. So for people who that kind of thing drives them nuts, having a set schedule, always having to be with the guide, then land-based can be the way to go or doing that combo can be the way to go. So you are on the cruise, you get out to some of those further out islands but then kind of at that stage where you'd start to kind of get restless, you can then get off the boat and have a little bit more free time and flexibility. So with a land-based trip, we can make it entirely private. So it's just you and your own group and your private guide. So that allows us to make it as active as you wanna be. We don't, you know, the cruises do have to cater, like I said, to a wide variety of activity levels. So if you're wanting to bike, you're wanting to do full day hikes, you wanna see the wildlife, but you also wanna be really active and not be set to kind of as much of a set schedule on a cruise, then a land-based trip can really be a great fit for you in that sense. There also, if you're someone that you want to see the wildlife and maybe that is the highlight, but you also really love culture on trips and you want to really experience some of the culture there as well. Certainly culture isn't the reason people are heading to the Galapagos, but there is a cool kind of history and culture to the Galapagos Islands. It's a very different place to live and grow up. And I do love that about a land-based trip that you connect more with people who live there, learn more from people on different islands of kind of what it's like to live in the Galapagos and specifically on Floriana Island, like I said, with Claudio hearing from him about kind of this mysterious history and what it was like when his parents first arrived to the Galapagos. Um, it's, that's a cool aspect of land-based as well too. Um, so they both have their pros, cons. I'm not someone, some people believe one of these is the best way to see the Galapagos Islands. I think there's a best way for each individual traveler. Um, I think a full land-based trip is the best fit for some, a full cruise is the best for some, and I think a combo is the best fit for a lot as well. So you kind of get a little bit of both. All right, 
So again, this is that kind of same map. So kind of now that we've talked about cruise versus land-based, a recap on that. This main island here, that's Santa Cruz. So that's where the largest town of Puerto Ayora is and where most people on, on a land-based trip will be based. So staying at one property I love, um, more luxury level accommodations, Galapagos Safari Camp in the Highlands, you're doing then day trips out to different islands. So you can do a day trip to North Seymour, you can do a day trip to Bartholomew, um, to Santa Fe, to several different islands. So you're seeing that wildlife, but then you're back to sleeping on land and you can explore this island by land with your private guide on Santa Cruz. So that's one way to do a, um, a land-based trip or doing an island hopping. This island down here is Floriana. If you're really fascinated with culture, I suggest including Floriana on a land-based trip. Isabella's here. If you really wanna hike, you wanna bike, you wanna enjoy white sand beaches, I suggest going to Isabella. This is the area you can kind of see on a land-based trip. Um, and there's one of my favorite hikes in the Galapagos, hiking up Sierra Negra Volcano, which is definitely one of those spots where you feel like you're walking on a different planet. That's a really awesome full day hike there. We include lunch at a farm, really neat day. There's also some great snorkeling off of Isabella. Um, and then San Cristobal as well. Um, San Cristobal has some great opportunities for snorkeling with sea lions. Um, some cruises and um, some cruises start or end in San Cristobal. So if your cruise starts or ends there, it can be a good spot to add on a few, few nights to a cruise from there. So these are the four islands you can involve in a land-based trip, whether it be an island hopping trip or being based from one island and doing day trips out to other islands from there. On a cruise, the cruises can visit kind of, you know, the whole of the Galapagos Island, but even like I said, on a seven night, eight day cruise, you'd likely cover about half of this. So you'll see cruises with kind of northern itineraries or western itineraries, southern itineraries, or they call them eastern itineraries. All the cruises kind of call them different things. Okay, so how to pick. So if you have decided, okay, I want to do a cruise for my whole trip or at least part of it, how to pick the best cruise for you. Um, so one thing to consider is boat size and type mostly consider really boat size. You have kind of three different groupings of size in the Galapagos. You have a lot of small boats that are just about 16 passenger vessels, 16 passenger small yachts or 16 passenger catamarans. Um, those are really great for if you kind of decided, yeah, I wanna be on a boat so I can get to some of these further out spots, see a, a lot of the different visitor sites in one day but I'm really not a cruise person. I don't wanna be with a lot of people. Those 16 passenger boats can be great for that because it's just, again, really where I encourage travelers to see the cruise as their mode of transportation to and from these different sites. You're only with 16 passengers. It's just the one guide. You really get to know the guide because they're often kind of sitting and having dinner with you as well. Um, the 16 passenger vessels are also great for chartering. If you have a group of friends that are interested in going or kind of a multi-generational family trip, you can charter an entire vessel, especially if you have that 16 passenger group size, that's fantastic. Um, the mid-size um, boats and larger, for people who don't want to snorkel or really are concerned about how much they can walk or how active they are, um, or have kids and they really want kind of some other kids on board. Those are some reasons I lean towards the midsize or larger vessels. Like I said, the 16 passenger side re size really only has, has that one guide. So they don't have any ability to kind of split people up based on, okay, more active with this group or families with kids with this guide. Um, or some of you, it's a little bit harder for them to navigate. Some of you snorkel and some of you are gonna go in on these mid-sized vessels, they have glass bottom boats. So for people who really don't want to snorkel at all, I think the mid-sized and larger ships are fantastic because some of them have the glass bottom boats for you to see, still see that wildlife without snorkeling and they have the multiple guides so it's easier for them to navigate those different kind of interests. Um, and then a lot of them have these really fun kind of uh, metropolitans boats, for example, have a fun Pirates Aboard program so they can cater to kind of a variety of different ages all within that, that one vessel. Um, they're also good for if you do have concerns with seasickness. Sick, um, the smaller catamarans are pretty stable, but if you're really concerned 
Um, and you do get a little bit rockier waters, kind of August, September, beginning of October. Um, if you're going in that time and you're concerned about seasickness, then I, I suggest looking more towards that larger size of boat. Um, cruise duration. So again, four nights, five day is my kind of what I consider the minimum duration. And I think I maybe have, yeah. So let me get down to that slide. Um, so here with the sizes, you can also with the smaller ones, consider the type of boat. There really aren't many sailboats in the, and they can't really use the sails to solely navigate based on those. So mostly it's monohull and catamarans. The catamarans can be a little bit more stable unless you're looking towards that luxury class than the monohulls in the luxury class. Most of them have stabilizers and, and are really quite stable as well. Um, but diving into the duration. So four nights, five days is really the best minimum duration for your full trip. Um, this is a duration I like a lot if you want to include a lot of mainland Ecuador too, and you want to go to the Galapagos, but you also want to see Ecuador. So you can't devote your whole trip to the Galapagos. Um, it's also a duration that I really love when kind of same idea when combining with Machu Picchu and Peru, which is an incredible combo, but you really need two weeks to do it justice. And even so more with that four night, five day itinerary. So you, you know, have time to devote to Peru as well. Um, but it's a great duration. It still gives you three full days in the Galapagos. You can get to some further out sites with it as well. Um, five night, six day is a duration that I love because it gives you a little bit more time than that four night, five day. Um, unfortunately, the only downside of five night, six day, or also there's a few six night, seven day is that there aren't many of them. So if stuck on that duration, um, it really limits the cruise options available to you out there. There aren't many boats offering that duration. Seven night, eight days, kind of your typical full length Galapagos experience. Um, so if Galapagos, you've been looking forward to it for I don't know, since you've been a kid and it's the focus of your trip, you've been saving up for it, you really like to snorkel, so are excited to have not just two or so times to snorkel, but you wanna snorkel a lot of different times. Um, then the seven night, eight day cruise is, is it's a really fantastic experience for people who like wildlife and like snorkeling. It's not too long for them. Um, you're, while well, you're seeing similar wildlife, you're doing a lot of different experiences each time with the wildlife. Um, and then the three night, four day cruise, it's too short for your full Galapagos trip, but I love this duration for pairing with land-based. So a three night, four, four day cruise plus two nights or three nights land-based is a really cool combo of different experiences in the Galapagos. Like I said, taking advantage of that cruise to get to some further out islands, but then getting off the boat and, and maybe doing a full day hike or some more active excursions or day at leisure to just relax on a beach as well. Um, that's a cool duration for that combo. Island. So like I kind of mentioned a little bit before, there are, um, I suggest people don't get too wrapped up into the itinerary. Um, when people do that, they end up kind of driving themselves crazy. At the end of the day, know that as long as you're, you know, working with a reputable company and on a reputable boat, um, you're going to have a fantastic Galapagos experience. There's really incredible wildlife throughout the Galapagos Islands. Like I said, you're going to see the tortoises on any trip. You're going to see the sea lions. You're going to see the iguanas, whether it be flying above or kind of on rocks. You're going to see the blue-footed boobies. Um, but if you do have something very specific, like I really want to make sure I see the penguins. I love penguins. Then pay a bit more attention to it. So the spot, best spots for seeing the penguins are Isabella Island or Bartolome Island. Um, so if you really want to see those, go there. The blue-footed boobies, if you really want that experience of kind of seeing them more up close, North Seymour is a highlight for that, as is Española is good for seeing the blue-footed boobies. Um, if you consider yourself a birder, look on your itinerary to see that it either has North Seymour as a good birding spot, Española and specifically on Española, if you go from April through the end of December, that's when you get nearly the entire world population of the waved albatross there. Um, so if a birder and you're going to Española, something to keep an eye on with those dates. Um, and then Genovesa is also, as you can see, it's nicknamed Bird Island, a really great spot for birding. Um, snorkeling, again, I suggest people don't get too caught up on this, rely on the specialist that you're working with to you know, get you on a good itinerary. But 
The western side of Isabella, if snorkeling is the highlight of your trip, what you're most looking forward to, that western side of Isabella has some fantastic snorkeling, um, as does Floriana. There are a few really great, specifically Devil's Crown spots on Floriana. Um, if the cruise specifically goes to Devil's Crown and it's not a spot you can go to on a land-based trip. Um, but again, this is, I've been doing this for <laughs> six years now um, and it, it I, you know, if people try and understand all this, it'll, it'll drive them crazy. So just make sure to express to the specialist you're working with if you do have priorities in the Galapagos as far as the wildlife experiences that you want. All right, so a little bit on weather. Um, I don't really like these graphs because they just show the average. Um, but in Quito, usually your lows are going to be 30s, maybe low 40s, and the highs are going to be more in the 60s. You don't really get much variation with that during the year. Um, and you really can get four seasons in any day, any time of year in Quito. The biggest seasonality you see is that you do get, you can get rain any time of year, um, as you can see, but the drier months really are kind of June, July, August, um, especially July. Um, so if you're doing a trip that's hiking intensive, maybe you're going to Cotopaxi National Park and you're doing three days of hiking, and you know you really want to go during that driest time, then look towards June, July, August for that trip. The Galapagos seasonality, um, the hottest months of the year are kind of February, March, and April. The coolest times of year are August and September. So if you have a really hard time with heat and humidity, you could consider looking more towards that August, September timeframe. On the flip side, that August, September, early October, it's cooler because you get a cold water current coming in, you get a breeze coming in, um, but with that you do also get some choppier water. So if you want to be on a small boat, you really want to do a longer cruise, for example, and you have a history of seasickness, look instead towards outside of that window, looking more kind of November through June. Um, time frame to get you outside of that time with a little bit rockier waters. Um, but it's important to know as well that the Galapagos isn't like some destinations where you can have really rocky waters. Um, I do get seasick and I've been there in the middle of September on a small cruise and I was fine. I wore the these C bands that kind of use pressure points and took uh, Sailor's Secret, which is just this natural ginger supplement. And that worked fine for me the whole trip, except for one night they gave us advance notice. We're doing a longer crossing this evening. We're going against the current. Um, we're doing it at night. So take your Dramamine and, and go to bed. And, and that's what I did and, and was fine. Um, all right. So prepping for your trip to Ecuador. Does Ecuador have any visa requirements? Is there anything I need to do ahead of time to get into the country? So this is where I'm gonna talk about what probably a lot of people are wondering is, can I go to Ecuador now? And you actually can. Ecuador has been open to travelers without quarantine requirements since August. Um, and they, so they've been open a while, cruises, you know, there wasn't obviously much demand back in August. Demand is really starting to pick up. The cruises are really operating again. Um, we've had several groups go. I have travelers there right now. I'm actually myself departing in, um, three weeks for Ecuador. So you can go there. The nice thing about Ecuador now is they, if you're vaccinated, they are accepting vaccination to enter the country. So you can just show your proof of vaccination that you've had a full dose of the vaccine to get in. Um, or you can show if you, you're not vaccinated, a negative COVID test, either antigen or the PCR ones, from within three days um, to enter Ecuador. So if you're not vaccinated, you can still go. You just need to meet these testing requirements. Um, if you are vaccinated, you're good to go to get into Ecuador with that vaccination card. The Galapagos does have a separate requirement. Even if you are vaccinated, you need a negative RT-PCR COVID test from within 96 hours of arriving in the Galapagos. Since, especially that type of test, getting that test, getting the results, boarding your flight, flying to Quito, having two nights in Quito, and then flying out to the Galapagos, that can be, be cutting it a little too close with that 96 hours. What I'm suggesting most travelers do, and, and what a lot of our travelers thus far have been doing, is we arrange 
for another COVID test for you in country. So those two nights in Quito, for example, you arrive in Quito in the evening. The next day in the morning, we have someone arrive to your hotel. They administer the COVID test. You go out on your full day of exploring. That evening, the results are sent to your hotel and printed, and you have them ready to go to the airport the next morning and fly to the Galapagos. Um, so we do make it pretty easy for you. And, and that's what I suggest most people do. So we can make sure you have the results in time, make sure it's the right test. And then for anywhere you go right now, the US does require a negative COVID test um, from within 72 hours to fly back to the US. And again, that's something we arrange for you in country, flying back from the Galapagos and then home. You often end up with this really long layover which right now works perfect because we arrange for the an airport hotel for day use for you. You go there, again, someone arrives, takes your test. For the US, it can be a rapid antigen test. So you get the results in a few hours. Again, the hotel prints them and you're ready to go with your test to go back to the airport and fly home. Um, so it is possible to travel to Ecuador right now if you are looking for a place to get out. There are a lot of great deals in the Galapagos right now as well for the summer. Um, and we have quite a few going on as well. You can reach out to us at travel at nomadadventures.com. Um, but it's also a great spot if you're you know, not ready to travel yet, which we certainly understand for looking for later trips or a good first trip for 2022 as well. Um, and one thing to be aware of as well is masks are a requirement in Ecuador and in the Galapagos Islands in public spaces. All right, um, so what immunizations and shots do I need to travel to Ecuador? So aside from everything we just discussed with COVID, um, you don't need any immunizations. Uh, if you're going to the Amazon, we do recommend the yellow fever vaccine um, and typhoid and hep A while not required are a good idea as well. What current, in Ecuador, they just use the US dollar, which makes it super easy. They switched, I believe, in 2000. Um, so now you go to an ATM and you get dollars out. That's the official currency. So it makes it really easy for travel there. When I go, I just get dollars before I go. So I don't even have to worry about using ATMs while I'm there. Um, and then also making travel to Ecuador easy is that they use the same voltage and same plug type as in the US. So you don't have to worry about that either. Can I drink the water in Ecuador? That, no, you can't. Um, so hotels will have kind of large jugs of water out at breakfast or in their hotel you can use to fill your water bottles. On your cruise, the water from the tap may or may not be drinkable. You ask them, it depends on the cruise. Um, but regardless, they'll also have large jugs of water out that you can use to refill your bottle. So always bring a refillable water bottle with you. Um, so you're also not buying a bunch of new plastic water bottles. Um, so what to pack, um, you can find all this information on our website. Um, so just kind of a few highlights I wanna point out that are important. One is sunscreen. You are on the equator here and it's hot and humid and the sun is really powerful and sunscreen is extremely expensive if you forget it and need to buy it in the Galapagos or Ecuador. So pack a good amount of sunscreen so you can you know, reapply several times in the day. Um, and then also something to think about for packing is, like I said, those wet landings. You will, if on a cruise, have these, any land-based trip doing day trips out to other islands, um, have wet landings where you step off of the little boat into the water and then walk on shore. So Tevas, um, Keens, Chacos work well for that. Um, what I do is, even though I have a pretty good pair of Keens that are good for walking, I don't want to be doing too much walking on them on these kind of rocky surfaces. So I'll have my um, more kind of lightweight hiking shoes, socks, and a little towel in my backpack to after doing the wet landing to switch over into those. Um, but you're gonna need something that you can step into the water in and comfortably get on shore, whether that then be your shoe, you're doing the excursion in, or you're switching shoes like I do, um, that's a uh, personal preference. Um, and then another thing to think about is you really want your back covered when you're snorkeling because of that sun. Um, because of that, whether the water's warm or cold, and for me, I'm a wimp, so it's cold year round. Um, I wear the wetsuits provided on the boat, um, but if you tend to not like to wear a wetsuit, I bring just kind of a rash guard or a shirt or something you can have on to cover your back from the sun when you're snorkeling. 
So here's just a sample cruise itinerary to kind of show you what I was talking about. You'll be able to see for any cruise what their itinerary is and where it goes. So this is a seven night, eight day cruise. And as you can see, it covers about half of the islands. This boat, they have this itinerary and then they have another seven night, eight day that covers the other half of the islands. It's kind of just going through it. And you can see all this on our website as well, or really everything on our website are just, especially with our Ecuador stuff, they're just samples for what you can do. Everything we do is so custom. So the first step is really reaching out to us. So a specialist can work with you on, on making specific suggestions for your own trip. Um, this is an extent an example going up to that Otavalo area where you can visit um, the market, do a little bit of hiking up there too with a three night stay. Culture and nature. So you don't have to go to the Galapagos to have an incredible trip in Ecuador. In fact, Ecuador, I think it's skipped over a lot because of the Galapagos and it's really an incredible country. I love sending travelers that are just doing an Ecuador focused trip as well. One of my favorites for those is combining the Amazon jungle with Otavalo because those are two such distinct regions of the country and really kind of show, um, show how many different kind of the vast differences between regions in Ecuador. So this is one sample of, of that itinerary. And then to give you an idea of a really cool land-based trip, I love this one for people who are active and like a little bit more culture and are okay with kind of some more rustic level accommodations because that's what you have on Floriana Island. Population, there's less than 50 people. There's just the one hotel, Claudio's, and it's kind of rustic oceanfront cabins, kind of what you'd imagine cabins being that you stay at in national parks a lot. Um, but it's a great itinerary, you spend two nights in Floriana, get that kind of cultural experience, also see tortoises there, do some hiking, then over to Isabel Island, Isabel Island for that hike up a volcano, kayaking, bike riding, um, time on a beach as well, snorkeling, and then ending in Santa Cruz, which is one of the best spots to see the giant tortoises in the highlands. And we also do some biking and kayaking there. So a really cool kind of multi-sport and boss culture to land-based trip is, is this sample one on our itinerary on the website. Um, all right, well, that wraps it up. Um, usually at this point at the expo, I have a table of these $200 travel credits for you to come and get. Obviously I can't hand those to people right now. So if you would like one, please email us, email us at travel at nomadadventures.com and just let us know you were at the presentation and you'd like a travel credit. Um, even if you don't know if you wanna do a trip or not, just email us so you can get the travel credit just in case. Um, try and email us within a week or two. I know these videos go up on the web, on YouTube, I think, and we um, don't want out there forever with the travel credits. So if you've attended, just email us within a week or two, let us know you attended and, and you'd like that travel credit and we will send it over to you. Um, and with that, I will open it up to any questions. Hey, Renee, can you hear me? <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> didn't see you were taking a drink there. I just posted your email address and Nomad Adventures uh, website link in the chat there. I see a few people watching, um, at least clicked that have clicked into the chat. Um, thank you to those watching and uh, for those of you not in the chat and also watching, thank you as well. Um, a lot of great stuff. I always love, really enjoy your guys' presentations. I, I can't say that enough. Um, it's um, I'm a big fan of Latin American countries. I've not made it to the Galapagos one day, one day for sure. I think it's it's uh, high on my list. It makes me think of, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, maybe everyone has at this point, but uh, it reminded me of uh, Ted from Schitt's Creek. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of as I was watching. I was like, oh yeah, like I, where have I heard Galapagos recently? A lot, and we just kind of finished watching that. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I love the show hearing the mentions of the Galapagos Islands. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I'm sure it uh, tugs at sort of the heartstrings for you or at least some of your memories uh, from helping people get out there. Um, I don't see any questions popping up, but uh, I just want to remind people that, you know, these presentations are re recorded and they'll be on our YouTube page. Um, and be sure to connect with Nomad Adventures on any Latin American, South American travel. Um, uh, they do a fantastic job. I really liked um, you kind of mentioning sort of the the process of trying to fit in that in-country COVID test. I thought that was really nice, sort of really no fuss, just kind of 
almost a white glove service, really. Um, yeah. Just kind of like you get to your place, you know, you settle in next morning, it's taken care of, you go out in your day, and that, I mean, that's just sort of in some, in from some people's perspective, sort of the essence of travel is just keep moving, not having to really stop so much unless unless it's a planned stop part of your itinerary so i think that that really helps um clear some of that up for people so thank you for pointing that out i thought that was really uh, really, really important to mention um well with that being said i don't i don't personally have any questions i uh just want to say thank you again renee and nomad adventures everyone over there um and let's see coming up next we have cliff jacobson at two o'clock talking about packing and porting portaging excuse me um so be sure to tune in for that at 2 p.m we'll sign off for a little bit here and take a break and uh thank you everyone have a nice day awesome thank you good luck You're with welcome. the rest of the expo thank you so much bye bye